mentioned how successful I am tonight, but whether or not I kick over that water before the night's over. Um, I'd just like to begin actually by, by describing um, the difference between approaching these things as a structural engineer and approaching them as a, an architectural historian based on two things that Carol said. One was talking about Jack Foreman being an engineer, and the other one was about the, uh, the illustration over there of the New York Times building. Um, the New York Times building on Times Square is not structurally very interesting. It's a, it had been done already when that building was built in terms of structure. It's a tall, slender, steel frame building. Um, what's fascinating about it is that when they built it, they tore down a seven-year-old building, the Pabst Hotel. And the Pabst Hotel was one of the first steel frames, steel skeleton frame buildings to be demolished. So the forensic report of the condition of the, of the Pabst building at the time of its demolition uh, actually is the, the interesting story from a structural viewpoint of the uh, New York Times building, which tells you how skewed my view of the world is, that I'm more interested in what was taken down than I am in the, the Times building itself. Um, next slide. <coughs> yes, I do. Can everybody hear me? Um, I've discovered in giving these talks that I have a tendency to go very, whoops, can we back up a slide? Yep. I have a tendency to uh, go very slowly and sort of lay out my evidence, and by the time I get to the conclusion, everybody's forgotten where I started from. So I want to start with the conclusion this time around, which is that you, there's no such thing as the first skyscraper. Um, so the whole argument of Chicago versus New York, which has occupied an enormous amount of space in both academic journals and sort of popular press about skyscrapers is, in my opinion, mistaken. Um, th there's a technological continuum uh, that starts with bearing wall buildings, and I'll define all this stuff as I go ahead, and ends with modern skeleton frame buildings. And it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to put your finger on one point along that continuum and say, this is where the evolution produced something completely different from what came before. Um, each little step was something that was different than it came before it. And I don't know that you can really say this is this is it's so distinct from, from the predecessors that's worth calling something different. So not only can I not pin down what's the first skyscraper, I can't even tell you, you know, obviously by 1903, uh, something like the, uh, the Flatiron Building is going up. That is, by anybody's definition, a skyscraper. Uh, but 1903 would be far too late to, to pin the date. So I think it's pretty much impossible. Um, one of the things that usually goes into the definition of a skyscraper is that it has a skeleton frame. And I'll define that in detail in a few minutes. Um, so one way of getting around my, my little conundrum here is to say, well, what was the first skeleton frame building? And the answer is, well, there are two that are almost simultaneous. Uh, one in New York and one in Chicago. So once again, I don't have to worry about New York versus Chicago. Um, the, the two buildings are not identical. The next slide, which you already had a preview of, will show you that. But they are both definably skeleton frame buildings, which is sort of the last piece of the technology that was required uh, in order to say that you had a skyscraper. The one on the left is the London and Lancashire Insurance Company in New York. The one on the right is the Manhattan Building in Chicago. Um, I have a, a good friend who's an architect in Chicago, and it annoys her no end that the first skeleton frame building in Chicago is named Manhattan. Um, obviously, the Manhattan building is quite a bit bigger. It was the first 16-story building built in, in the country, and arguably, I, I believe it's the first 16-story modern building. Uh, there may be some buildings uh, that had 16 usable floors in antiquity, but that's a different issue entirely. Um, and you know, looking at these two, these two illustrations, the drawing of the London and Lancashire and the photograph of the Manhattan building, you might say, well, obviously the Manhattan building is much taller, it's much bigger, um, therefore it's the more important building. Except uh, that one of the very important things from my perspective, from my skewed structural engineering view of the world, is what's called slenderness, which is the height of the building divided by its base width. Um, it's very easy to build tall if your building is wide enough. Think about the pyramids. They are very tall, but none of us would say that they are skyscrapers. Um, the one in the Lancashire building <coughs> is quite slender, actually. Uh, I believe it, it, it's, I believe, uh, 35 feet wide and nine stories tall. That's a fairly slender building. The Manhattan building, and you can see here, this is the short dimension. Um, is not exactly squat, but it's not as slender. So the fact that it's taller is not so clear cut that it's, it's more important. Um, anyway, let's go to the next slide. So, 
you'll need to find how I'm going to judge everything that I talk about from here on. Um, what does a building have to do structurally? In other, words, in other words, what does my profession do for a living? Um, the first and most obvious thing is that a building has to be able to support load against gravity. Um, the simple, think of the simplest possible building, which is a tool shed. If the roof isn't supported against gravity, the roof falls down, you no longer have a usable building. So support against gravity, I think, is fairly obvious. Support against lateral loading, that is um, an anachronism using the phrase lateral loading because these days every building code has both wind and seismic loading and earthquakes in it. Uh, at the time that we're talking about, 120 years ago, uh, only wind was considered, if it was considered at all. So it should really say support against wind if we're talking about the origin of uh, skeletal framing. Um, again, I think that's, oh, sorry. I'm, oh, am I, I'm not being filmed <laughs> uh, I think it's, it's uh, fairly obvious you need support against wind, again, or your, your shed blows over and it's not very usable. The next one sounds very obscure, but it's obvious when you think about it. If you don't have floors inside your building, you don't actually have a building. What you have is a chimney, um, or the Statue of Liberty, which is a great structure, but it's not a building. So for a building to be a building, you need to have interior floors, and they somehow need to be supported. Um, similarly, enclosure against weather, you know, what if you're in Tahiti? You know what, even in Tahiti there are times when you want the interior climate to be different than the exterior climate. It's raining or the wind is blowing or whatever, and for a building to be a building, you need to have an interior. Um, years ago at the Museum of Modern Art, there was an exhibition in which a Japanese architect took the phrase curtain wall very literally and had a house where one of the walls was a shower curtain. Um, even the shower curtain gives you some enclosure against the weather, right? So, Enclosure against the weather, absolutely required. The last one, which if you read the whole slide, I'm referring to as a half a criterion, is, is fire protection. You don't absolutely have to have this. Um, as a, a thought experiment, you could build a building that looked like the Empire State Building. It's the same height, same exterior. It had the same stone and aluminum <coughs> as, as stainless steel curtain wall. Uh, it had the same steel frame. But instead of having concrete floors, you have wood joists spanning between the steel beams on the inside, and then a wood plank floor, floor laid over those joists. You, certainly, there's nothing stopping you from building this other than the building code, other than the laws. But physically, you could build that. Um, you could not pay me to set foot in that building because it is a death trap. Um, all wood buildings sooner or later have some kind of fire. Uh, an 86-story building with wood floors would be a fire I wouldn't want to see. So you don't absolutely have to have fire protection, but if you're talking about skyscrapers, if you're talking about large buildings, at some point it becomes meaningless unless the building is fire protected. It can't be built. It can't be built practically. And can I just say Lee Gray made the point in his lecture about the Tribune building, 1875, is that fireproof building was one of the first criteria for it. Well, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to this in a little, whoop, can we go back? Sorry. Uh, I'm going to get to this a little bit later, but um, the year 1872 is a banner year for the, for the development of skyscrapers for a very simple reason. 1871, you had the Chicago fire that you've all heard about. 1872 was a less famous fire in Boston, and that was sort of the beginning of everybody saying big buildings have to be fireproof, and I'll, I'll get to that in a, in a minute or two. Uh, next slide, please. So, let's start with the kind of buildings people have been building forever, since people have been building buildings. And that is barren wall buildings. And the, the name of it gives it away. This is what it is. You have masonry barren walls. Let me just uh, back up for one second. You can have a wood barren wall building. It's what, in this country, we call a private house. You have wood stud walls that hold up the building. Um, we're talking about large buildings. You can't build a very large wood barren wall building. So for the purpose of this conversation, masonry barren walls, they can support either wood joist floors or some kind of masonry vaulting or wrought iron beams carrying masonry vaulting or steel beams carrying masonry vaulting. Um, so your gravity support is that the walls are carrying the floor. Um, your lateral bracing is the walls. Without the walls, the building is not, does not, cannot resist the wind pressure. Your enclosure is the walls. This is getting a little bit repetitive. Your interior floors are either wood plank on wood joy on the wood joist if you have a wood joist floor, or if you have masonry vaulting, you put your flooring down on top of that. You get fire protection from the walls 
and you get fire protection in, in for example, a wood building from the interior plaster. Plaster is a very good fireproofing material. Um, but I want to point out, I'm not going to really go on about fire for most of this talk. Fire spread was a problem that didn't go away. Uh, fires spread through the exterior of the building. In other words, fire goes out the window and comes back into the same building on a higher floor. Fire goes out the window and spreads to the neighbor. So how do you get those citywide conflagrations like Chicago and Boston and New York in 1845? It happens because fire spreads from building to building. So you get some fire protection. I'm not going to harp on this too much, but it, the problem doesn't go away. The problem still exists today. How do you keep fire from spreading from one building to the next? This is a cartoon of a building. Why is it a cartoon? Uh, well, it's missing a few things. It's missing doors, windows, stairs, elevators, plumbing, electric lighting, gas lighting. Um, in other words, it's missing everything that doesn't matter to the structural engineer. Uh, the, I, I created this years ago, and I realized, you know, this makes perfect sense to me, but for most people, this is still a little bit hard to read. Next slide, please. So uh, I said, okay, let's do a cartoon of the cartoon. This is about as simple a diagram as I can get. This is a building sliced from top to bottom. You've got an exterior wall, an interior wall, <coughs> interior, uh, interior floor beams. Uh, so this is your, your cartoon of a cartoon of a barren wall <coughs> building. Um, this may seem like I'm oversimplifying. Let me point out, if you look at the New York City Building Code from 1882, 1887, 1892, in the era where the only way to build a building was a barren wall building, 1882 is when they started. People only thought in terms of barren wall buildings. Um, they have diagrams that look exactly like this. In other words, there's one on the wall over there. Okay, there's one on the wall over there. Um, I, I'm pretty sure the building department didn't think that architects, engineers, and contractors were illiterate, but they made the point of giving diagrams. This is what the walls should look like. And one of the important things is that the walls step out. They get thicker as you come down the building, which helps you with both gravity support and lateral load support. So this is a fairly straightforward thing. You can see how the building works. Um, if you want to see one of these in real life, the one I always recommend to everybody is the Chelsea Hotel, uh, where the rooms are relatively quiet because basically you have two rooms between two walls. So you only have one neighbor who can possibly keep you away, uh, which is po probably one of the reasons that Chelsea has a history of uh, writers and musicians and whatever Sid Vicious was. Uh, next slide, please. Um, that was, that was what, I, what I think of as a pure barren wall building. Um, something that shows up before 1870 is the concept of uh, getting rid of some of the interior barren walls and replacing <coughs> them with beams and columns. Uh, if you go into Soho, you will see a large collection of barren wall buildings built in the 1850s and 60s that have exterior barren walls and interior columns. Um, but, you know, those, are, those were built as warehouses and factories, and honestly, uh, not the kind of buildings that architects and engineers pay much attention to. Um, the Equitable Life Insurance Building, and this is um, Broadway and Pine Street we're looking at here. The building on the left, building on the far left, is the old 111 Broadway, which is where the American Institute of Architects was founded. Uh, the building in the center is obviously the uh, Equitable Life, that's the little picture is of. That's, uh, 120 Broadway. Uh, George Post, when he was a relatively young, relatively lesser known architect, got the commission for this building. And one of the ways he, he won the commission was saying, you know, you don't have to waste all that interior space on big masonry walls and piers. Instead of wasting all that space, why don't you use the, the newfangled technology of cast iron columns and wrought iron beams, and you can reclaim usable space on every floor and therefore make more money. Um, there are actually people who claim this is the first skyscraper. Uh, it is about 120 feet tall, which is very tall uh, for, for the era. Um, I personally have a hard time thinking of it as a skyscraper. Again, it's not very slender. And it is in the end of Barry Wall Building. Next slide, please. Okay, that's, we're going to skip. We're, this is the, the standard cartoon, a realistic cartoon mm -hmm. of a mixed bearing wall building. Let's go to the next one. Here's the simplified cartoon of a, bear, of a mixed bearing wall building. You've got a bearing wall, a bearing wall, and up the center, you've got a line of cast iron columns and wrought iron beams. So you've gotten rid of that big, thick wall that was in the middle of the building earlier. Um, it means a couple of things. Uh, the good news is it means it's much easier to move about the building. You no longer have a wall separating the building in half. 
um, you, that line of columns and beams obviously takes up less space than the bearing wall that it replaced it. Uh, the downside is a fire on the left side of the building now has nothing impeding it from getting to the right hand side of the building. So it's not all good. It also assumes that cast iron columns are a good way to build a building, which it turned out in the long run they were not. Um, but that's something that's getting ahead of myself. Next slide, please. Ooh, that's a little hard to read, isn't it? William Fryer was an engineer. Uh, he was one of the first engineers to be involved in building construction. It seems strange when, you know, looking at it from the modern viewpoint, but in the mid-19th century, engineers built things like bridges and railroads and dams. They weren't involved in buildings. Even when you had iron elements in the building, they were designed typically by the ironworks who might or might not have an engineer employed by them. So the, uh, one of the things that happens with the influx of new technology into buildings is that engineers are, are now required um, because the, the iron framing gets to be too complicated to, to, do, to deal with in an ad hoc fashion. So Fryer is one of the first engineers involved. Uh, he actually was uh, involved with the New York City Building Department for a while and spent quite a few years as an independent consultant. And this is an article he wrote for the Architectural Record in 1891. These are illustrations of that, that article in which he's describing the development of metal framing. And he says, well, you start off, start off with a masonry pier, and then you say, well, you put a cast iron column next to it to carry some of the interior floor framing. And then the obvious thing to do is to embed the, the cast iron column in the masonry pier. And then the obvious thing to do is to embed it entirely in the masonry pier. So he's describing an evolutionary process here. And then he shows, it's unfortunately hard to read in these slides, Here's your cast iron column. Here's a big masonry wall. You can see the cast iron column is sort of embedded in the masonry pier within the column. Same thing here. And what you've got is floor beams that all go back to the column. So he's showing a metal skeleton embedded in a heavy masonry wall. Um, this, is, this is a new idea. This is actually a change of construction. It is not what we would call a modern skeleton frame. It is saying that the loads for large buildings have gotten too big for the masonry to carry. And therefore, we need the greater strength of a cast iron column to carry those loads. Next slide, please. So that gets to what, what I've started calling, I started calling 15 years ago a cage frame. Um, we have uh, a lot of language problems. When, when you go back and you look at the old buildings, is that the, the meaning of certain words has changed over time. Um, there are two main types of metal frame built in the 1890s. The one I'm describing here, and something that looks like modern skeleton framing. And there are two words, cage and skeleton. The problem was in the 1890s, those two words were used both ways. So if you see somebody say it's a skeleton frame building, they might mean it's this. We no longer use the word cage to describe modern frame buildings. And we no longer build this kind of construction. So it seems to me the natural thing to do is to use the obsolete word with the obsolete concept, uh, which leads me to call these cage buildings. Um, but if you ever go back and start actually looking at these things, uh, the language isn't so clear. So per Fryer's drawing, the floors are supported by metal beams. Um, by 1891, they most likely would have been steel. Uh, the, the change from iron to steel was a gradual one. The two metals are used very similarly. And uh, except for the fact that steel is some 20 or 25% stronger at that time, um, there was really no difference in, in the way you would design one or the other. Uh, so the, the gravity support for, for the interior floors is the, the steel or maybe wrought iron beams that are supported by cast iron columns, including cast iron columns embedded in the exterior walls. The walls themselves support themselves. So those masonry walls are still bearing walls, it's just that they're only bearing their own weight. Most of the time, most of these buildings that were built, there is no lateral bracing in the metal frame. The lateral bracing of the building is the exterior walls, just as it was with bare wall buildings. Um, sometimes, and particularly with the, the more technologically hip architects, uh, there would be lateral bracing in the frame. And I'll show you a couple of examples of that. Yes? Were they aware of the fact that they needed the lateral bracing? Because it kind of come by accident up to this time. Uh, I'm going I'm to hedge a little bit to say it depends on who they are. Um, the, 
The magic moment for, ladder, for, for wind loading worldwide is the collapse of the Firth of Pay Bridge in, in 1879. Uh, it was a, a very high, considered to be a modern bridge, blew over in the storm and killed a lot of people because there was a train on the bridge when it blew over. And that was the point where people said, you know, we really need to take wind load seriously. Um, there had been some engineers had always taken it seriously and had always provided wind bracing. Uh, John and Washington Roebling are a good example of engineers who always looked at wind bracing. But not everybody had. After the Firth of Tay, it was impossible for anybody who understood what was going on to say, we don't have to account for wind. <coughs> the problem is a lot of buildings were being built by people who didn't understand what was going on. You had, as I said before, there were a lot of buildings being built without engineers being involved. And you had architects who had been building houses. They'd been building private houses you know, out in towns that were two stories high. They'd been building row houses that were maybe four stories high. And suddenly they get a commission to build a 12-story building. And they didn't have an engineer on the project. They didn't understand the difference in terms of wind loading between a four-story building and a 12-story building. So there's an example of somebody who didn't understand. On those projects where there were engineers, yes, it was understood. Or George Post uh, was an architect who originally was trained as an engineer. He understood. Um, so what you get in the, in the 1890s, I'm getting ahead of the story, but this is as good a place to say it as any. What you get in the 1890s is this bifurcation between um, mostly office buildings being built by teams of architects and engineers, and they address wind loading and all, every other criteria. Um, and mostly apartment houses being built by architects and contractors with an ironworks, and they don't have an engineer involved, and a lot of them didn't have wind bracing. And it's very clear in the late 1890s that these two camps exist, and the no wind bracing camp is saying, you guys are paranoid. And the wind bracing camp is saying, you're building dangerous buildings. And after a series of collapses, the no bracing camp sort of disappeared. Um, most of this is the same as for a barren wall building. The big difference is that the floors are now supported by the front. Next slide, please. Here's the difficult to read full scale cartoon. Next slide, please. Okay, this is where things start getting very interesting. So here's your step wall, and here's a column. And because the column goes in a straight line up and down, and the wall is not the same thickness, at the base of the building, you don't see the column. If you're standing in here and you look at this wall, what you see is a brick wall. At the top of the building, the column is actually in front of the wall, and somewhere in the middle, it's half embedded in the wall. And I've seen this, I mean, I, I knew it existed because there were certainly enough records to prove it existed, but the first time you see it, it is a little strange that as you walk down the building, the column disappears. Um, it also is dangerous because it, if, you, if you do a very cursory inspection of the building, this might lead you to believe it's a barren wall building. Uh, you have to look at every floor. It might not be that the columns are projecting from the exterior walls until you get all the way up to the top. Um, the biggest problem with this is actually in construction. If, as was usually true, there was no bracing in the frame, if you think about it, you can put up the metal frame much, much faster than you can build those big brick walls. So there was a tendency for the metal frame construction to get ahead of the masonry construction. Well, since without the masonry, the metal frame has no lateral stability, uh, there was a building called the Diamond Exchange Building on Maiden Lane that had, I think, six stories of metal framing that had been put up in advance of the masonry. They hadn't got the brick walls built yet. And somebody went and surveyed it and said, hey, you know, our metal frame is 18 inches out of plumb, which is not a negligible thing. And they got a, a winch, and they sort of pulled the building back vertical and then built the masonry walls around it. That kind of thing can damage cast iron columns. So a lot of these buildings have damage in them dating from construction. And when I said before there was a series of failures, most of those failures took place either during construction or immediately afterwards. So when completed, these buildings are, I would say, reasonably safe. Um, but during construction, they were not. And that, that was one of the problems with them. Next slide, please. Can I just say, people should look in the, in the World Annex um, exhibition case, because you can see the interior office floors uh, that the reporters working at their desks with the paired column, paired right cast iron columns outside the wall. The, the, uh, the world building was a cage building. I'm, I'm actually getting to all sorts of very pretty pictures. I just need to warm you up with the, with the talk first. Um, so 
I've come to truly despise the home insurance building over the years, uh, in part because you can today go buy an architectural history that says that uh, this is the first skyscraper. You can buy an architectural history today that says this is the first skeleton frame building, which it absolutely was not. Um, for some reason, people became obsessed with it, and I think I know what that reason is. I'll get to it in a minute. So 1884, um, it is probably the first real cage building completed. The first building where 100% in theory of the floor load was carried on the columns. Um, but just to be even more annoying, it turns out it isn't 100%. Uh, there were a very careful examination of this building was made when it was demolished in the 1930s. And it turns out that actually some of the floor load was carried on the perimeter walls. So really, this building has nothing unique about it other than it's famous. It's a nice enough building, um, or it was a nice enough building before it was demolished. Uh, I think the reason it got the reputation for being the first skyscraper, for being the first skeleton frame building, for being all these things that I would argue it is not, is the forensic investigation that was done when it was demolished. In other words, there were people who thought this is a very significant building in the history of skyscrapers. And when it was being taken down, let's examine it. And there was a long report, it was a study done as the building was taken down floor by floor, and there was a long report written which was published in both the professional architectural and engineering press. And I think that report is the origin of people thinking that it had the significance it does not. Um, you know, it, it was, oh, look at this, look at what we found. Except that if you examine other buildings of the same era, you would have found this exact same thing. Most of these buildings survived past the 30s. For example, um, the World Building and the Tribune Building made it all the way to the 1960s. By the time they were demolished, tall buildings being demolished was not such a big deal. And there was not the same attention <coughs> paid to them as they were taken down. So this is just me, you know, getting a pet peeve out of the way here. Uh, next slide, please. So what comes next? You now have a metal frame. What if you make that whole metal frame out of steel, and you make it so it has built-in bracing? Um, and it's strong enough to carry the exterior wall. This is, this is actually a significant, this is the reason that skeleton framing is seen as, by a lot of people as the mark of a skyscraper, is that one thing that has been true since the beginning of time, which is that the walls are supported and they support other structure, the walls support the, are supported on foundation, excuse me, and they support other structure, is turned on its head. All of a sudden, the building frame is supporting the walls. So, the gravity support for everything, for the floors and the walls, is provided by the frame. The lateral bracing is provided by the frame. The wall has been re reduced to just an enclosure. And if you take that to its logical conclusion, if it's just an enclosure, nobody says it has to be masonry anymore. And as early as the 19, 19-teens, people were building buildings with all glass exterior walls. The uh, Pauli building in San Francisco has pretty much an all glass exterior front facade. And that's 1916, something like that. Um, so once you remove all of the structural functions from that wall, it no longer needs to be masonry. Um, next slide, please. Even on this slide, one thing that should jump out at you is that the wall is the same thickness top to bottom. Next slide. So here's the very simple part of the skeleton building. You've got steel columns, steel floor beams, and you've got some kind of support at every, I'm showing it at every floor, that's the way it's typically done, for the exterior wall. The exterior wall is no longer a continuous wall top to bottom, or it does not have to be a continuous wall top to bottom. And that is the big technological change here. Um, and if you read descriptions of the first generation of skeleton frame buildings being built, um, the thing that people can't get over is not what we would expect. We think, oh, they were very tall, they were very slim. What people can't get over is that a masonry wall started in midair. <laughs> because on, when you're building a building, there's a lot of friction at the first floor. You've got, in the day, horse carts, now trucks going in and out of the site. You've got materials going in and out of the site, debris. You don't want to build this piece of wall if you don't have to. Well, people always had to. They had to build the first floor wall because that supported the second floor wall. But when you have a skeleton frame building, you don't have to build this wall at the first floor until the very end of the project. And that is what contractors figured out early mm -hmm. on, that they could save themselves having to repair a wall they had just built by not building it at the beginning. So you now had people seeing a masonry wall begin at the second or third floor level, which was 
to say the least, counterintuitive to people used to bearing wall construction. Next slide, please. So, we get to the pretty pictures. And now, now I really need to look at my notes because well, I don't remember every single building. This is City Hall in, in the foreground on the left and the World Building beyond. Um, City Hall is a early 19th century Mary Wall building, obviously. Uh, the World Building is part of this exhibition. This is actually a piece of the Tribune building here on the right. Um, the World Building is a cage frame building. Uh, this is about 1905. And this thing here is a crane. I'll come back to that crane in a, in a couple of minutes uh, because I think I know what it is. Um, one feature of bearing wall and cage buildings that is not true of skeleton frame buildings. Back to, again, the wall being supported on the frame. If the wall is supported on the frame, you can have setbacks in your building. The wall doesn't have to line up from one floor to the next. If it's a bearing wall building or a cage building where the wall is bearing its own weight, the wall pretty much has to go in a straight line from the top of the building to the bottom. Now, this George Post was able in the world building to do this small piece of build, small piece up here set back. There's a row of columns that pick up the, uh, the circular drum and the dome above. Um, but you notice the, the main portion of the building, the walls go up straight up and down. That is typically true of bare wall buildings and cage buildings. It is also typically true of the first generation of skeleton frame buildings, not because it had to be, not for technological reasons, but because of the architectural style of the era. In other words, we think of the, the later skyscrapers, the glory days of skyscrapers in the 1920s and 30s, people were building setback buildings. That was a change in architectural style, not a change in technology. Next slide, please. Okay, so. World building? Oh, th that is the, uh, the elevated train from Brooklyn coming over the Brooklyn Bridge. That's the train terminal at the end of the Brooklyn Bridge. Long, long, long time. World building, Tribune building, New York Times building, and behind the Times building, the American Track Society building. Um, Carol was talking about my work. One of the <coughs> things that's currently giving me a headache are these angels up here. We are trying to keep them from falling off that building. Um, about 1900, uh, some big buildings, right? Um, let me just make sure I get all this right here. Okay, so 1900, we're well into the skeleton frame here. This is a cage frame building with cast iron columns. This is a bearing wall building. This is a strange hybrid. Um, the New York Times building had what are called Phoenix columns, which are wrought iron circular columns. Uh, embedded within the masonry piers. That picture I showed you of William Fryer suggesting you put a, a column inside your masonry pier to reinforce it, that's what the, uh, the New York Times building is. Uh, and, and the Track Society building um, is a steel frame. One other thing I want to point out for the next slide, look at the relative heights of the buildings. Uh, the Tribune building is, I guess, about two stories shorter. The main block of the Tribune building is about two stories shorter than the main block of the World Building. New York Times building, at this angle, you can see maybe four stories of the Track Society building behind it. It's not that it's four stories shorter, it's more, short, it's more of a discrepancy than that, but at this angle, that's what it looks like. Next slide, please. We seem to have had some growth. The Tribune building is now taller than the World building, and you can barely see the Track Society building over the Times building. Um, notice that it is the bearing wall building and, and a, a sort of a hybrid cage building that have grown. Um, basically, as long as you don't exceed the crushing strength of your masonry, you can just keep building these walls higher and higher. Uh, the extension here is steel frame construction, actually, but it's sitting on the masonry of the lower floors. So what they've done is take advantage of the strength of masonry in extending these things upwards. Um, the problem with extending a steel frame building upwards, the reason, well, there are many, many reasons the Track Society building didn't get extended, but the reason it would be difficult to do so, in particularly in that era, um, is that you would have to justify it. In other words, nobody was analyzing the masonry in the Tribune building. They simply said, well, it's a masonry wall, we can continue it up. Um, somebody would have to analyze the steel frame of the Track Society building if you wanted to expand that. And the analysis would come back and say you were overstressing the columns. So there was no way to do it. 
uh, there's an advantage to being ignorant. And if you don't know the stress in your, in your structure, you don't have to worry about it. Um, the masonry in bearing wall and cage frame buildings is basically uh, an undesigned element. Oh, so I said before, the, uh, in, in the first picture of the world building, I, there was a crane. This extension was completed in 1906. I'm fairly certain that crane was part of the construction of the extension of the Tribune building. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, can we go back? One last thing. This building over here is called the Potter Building. Beautiful brick and terracotta building. Um, structurally very boring. It's a mixed bearing wall building. Uh, it was built on the site of a, a similar speculative office building. That's what it was at the time, a speculative office building. It's now apartments. It was built on the site of a similar building that burned down uh, rather spectacularly. It burned down in the space of about 45 minutes because it had wood interior floors. It was a tall bearing wall building with wood floors. If you remember what I said about those things being death traps. Um, a fire that's very familiar to anybody who ever read Jack Finney's novel uh, time and again. Um, the same owner built the Potter, but Mr. Potter built the Potter building uh, on the same site. And uh, what's interesting is that that was one of the first buildings in New York to have the cast iron fireproof with terracotta. So the era of, and, and the fire took place, I want to say 1882. Um, back by the way I said before, 1872 you have the Boston Fire. Uh, insurance companies were far more upset about the Boston Fire than they were about the Chicago Fire, even though the Chicago Fire destroyed thousands of buildings and the Boston Fire destroyed dozens, because the loss, the insurance loss for Boston was something on the order of 30% of the insurance loss for Chicago, even though it was a much smaller number of buildings, because it was the center of a well-established large city, as opposed to Chicago, where a large number of the buildings that burned were private houses. So insurance companies said, okay, it's time to get serious about fireproofing. Um, it, among other things, that's the era when the underwriter's laboratory was established. If you look at all your electric appliances, they have that UL label on them somewhere. Uh, the underwriter's laboratory was saying, how can we prevent this kind of building fire? Um, and one of the things that they did was to start, for example, charging more if you had a mansard roof on your building, because the Boston fire spread between mansards. So a lot of the impetus behind looking for ways to build lighter and more fireproof structure, not necessarily taller, came from the insurance companies following 1872. So 1882, which is not that but much longer later, longer later um, the 1882 building code was the first one in New York that demanded that all metal structure be, be fireproofed. And the Potter Building is one of the first buildings built with terracotta fireproof. Next slide, please. Uh, this is looking from the southeast to the northwest. So all the buildings we've just been looking at would have been over here. Um, this is what, what was originally called the syndicate building, uh, not because it was involved with the mob, but because it was built by a syndicate of investors. Uh, that is still there on Park Row. That was the tallest building in the world in 1899 when it was completed. And for, I guess, I guess it was the tallest until the Singer building went up. Um, the building to the left of it is the St. Paul building, which is a George Post building. Um, it was Post's first skeleton frame skyscraper. So Post had got his start in 1870 saying, let's use the new technology of cast iron columns instead of basin repairs on the interior. Here it is, and now I need to look something up. Uh, here it is building the St. Paul building, I think it's 1897. Um, and he's building a steel skeleton frame building. Uh, notice how slender those two buildings are. If you look at this building from Park Row, it's not very slender, but if you look at it from the side, it is quite slender. And the, unfortunately, demolished St. Paul building was very slender from any angle. Um, two other things in this photograph. First of all, the foreground. There's the early 19th century getting down towards uh, South Street. And secondly, this very slender building here, which I'll come back to in a minute. That's the, the, uh, the Mail and Express building. It's another newspaper building. 1892, Carrera and Hastings, who are most, most famous for the public library. Uh, that is a skeleton frame building. It's actually one of the earlier ones in 1892. Next slide. Um, this is looking the other direction. We are on VZ Street looking east. There's the front of the St. Paul building. And it always looks as if it was meant to be something bigger. As if, as if there should be more bays along Broadway than there aren't. Um, this is St. Paul's Chapel, which the building was named after, which is a mid-18th uh, mid century building. And here's the side of the Maryland Express building. Maryland Express building is what today we would call a slab. It's a, a long, narrow building. 
Um, one of the interesting distinctions between New York and Chicago, uh, New York skyscrapers first show up downtown on a very irregular street plan with a lot of small, irregular lots. A lot of the buildings have these funny wings going off in different directions, and some of those wings are very, very slender. Uh, Chicago's skyscrapers, well, Chicago's street layout as a whole is a, a grid. It has some diagonals, but it's a grid with fairly large blocks. And most of the early skyscrapers in Chicago were, were not as slender. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're a few, oh, by the way, what I'm doing is I'm going down part, I'm, going, I'm heading south. I started at the northeast end of Park Row, and I'm heading first south along Park Row, and now south along Broadway. Here's the Mail Express building. You can see how narrow it is across the Broadway front. This wing comes back, and then there's another wing facing the side street, which is at Barclay Street? Fulton. Fulton, thank you. Um, and uh, you can also notice that you know, Pereira and Hastings, quite an ornamental facade on Broadway, and something much more boring on the lot line. These are fire shutters. That's a very old-fashioned idea for, uh, fire, for fire protection. I said before, one of the issues was to keep your fire from spreading from your building to the next. Um, fire shutters, as far as I know, never really worked the way they were supposed to in terms of stopping fire spread. And at the Triangle Fire, they actively killed a bunch of people, so they went out of, went out of fashion. Um, you're seeing here some you know, 1890s respectable buildings. And then the future is off in the distance. Uh, the city investing building coming up here, still under construction. And then behind it, the Singer building, still under construction. Next slide, please. Ooh, that's washed out. It's really washed out. You can't see what I was pointing at. Um, city, <laughs> the Singer building. Oh, thank you. Yeah, if you can either turn up the contrast or turn down the brightness. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, it's like it's, like it's coming out of the fun. No, uh, yeah. well, that's not helping. Right. <laughs> there we go. That's what that's supposed to look like. Thank you. Check it out. symmetrical the way it was meant to be, and the Singer Tower behind it. Um, the Singer Tower is an interesting building. Uh, Singer built, the Singer Company built their building in, in sections. I think it was three or four building campaigns along their site. Uh, the earliest pieces are actually bare, were actually bearing wall construction. And then when they got the, a big enough site together to build the tower, um, that's obviously a structure <coughs> structure, about 600 feet tall. Uh, which is something you could not do in cage construction or marine <coughs> construction. Um, St. Paul's Chapel, the Mail and Express building. Um, these two buildings are the, the uh, Hudson Terminal, uh, the Hudson and Manhattan Tubes, what are now the path train. Uh, it's sort of interesting. It's two buildings, each of which has a very, very deep light core to make it look like twin towers. So it looks like you have four towers here. This, these are actually the same building. This is the other building. That is the core of the World Trade Center site today. <clears throat> um, so what you're seeing is that the 1892 steel frame building, this is, you know, for its time, an interesting building and, and a relatively early steel skeleton frame. But it's, it's you know, nothing compared to what came just a few years later. So the question is, you know, is this a skyscraper because it has a skeleton frame? And then you look at what's around it and say, maybe not. I don't think you can really pin this down. There's not been a point as I'm going through these buildings where you say there's a difference in scale that is a qualitative difference. Singer building is much taller than what came before it, but it's built just like what came before it. There's no structural difference between the, Manhattan, the Hudson Terminal and the Singer building. Just to complete the, the picture of evolution, this thing here with all this, these chimneys, that's the Astor House Hotel. That's 1836. And the reason it has all those chimneys is that if you're building a hotel in 1836, everybody has to have a fireplace. Next slide, please. 
It's a little bit of a washdown. Um, this is the Singer building under construction. This is the city investing building under construction, so nothing we haven't seen before. These small buildings here, this is the site of Zuccotti Park. Uh, this is 115 Broadway, which is 1907, and again, a steel skeleton frame building with a very heavy masonry exterior wall. Um, so if you look at the building, it could actually have been a cage building, um, but it isn't. It's got a steel skeleton frame. Next slide, please. That one's good. Um, this is moving just a little bit south again. We're looking east from Trinity Place. This is 115 Broadway, which is the not identical twin, but fraternal twin to 115. Trinity Church. This is the American Surety Building at 100 Broadway before it got expanded. Um, that is 1895, 1896, and is typically pointed out as one of the first skeletal frame buildings. It's not. What it is is the first building where there's no question that the exterior wall was designed not to bear load. In other words, if you look at Look at 111 Broadway, the Trinity building here. Um, the exterior wall is actually heavy enough to carry structural load. The American Surety building, it could not. So this had to be a steel skeleton frame built. It was also very tall, considered to be very tall when it was built in 1895, and then a few years later, it gets dwarfed by the Equitable building. The Equitable building there is the same site. The very first building I showed you, the Equitable building that George Post designed in 1870, that building burned down in, 18, in 1912. Um, this went up in 1915. Uh, it is 40 stories tall and basically 100% lot coverage at the base. There are light courts. Um, it has an FAR in modern terms, FAR 36. Uh, in other words, the amount of square footage in the building is 36 times the lot, which is incredibly high. Um, it is not the only reason that, that the 1916 zoning law got passed, but it certainly was a horrifying example of what would happen if we didn't get zoning. Uh, people could just build the entire lot and there was nothing stopping them from going up forever. This is, these two buildings are a good example of what I was talking about. They're steel frame buildings. They don't have to go up straight vertical. They could have setbacks, but they didn't because they weren't required by zoning and the architectural style of the time did not demand it. Next slide, please. Oops, can we go back one? Same. Area. There's Trinity Church again. There's American Surety again. This is uh, the Empire Building, 71 Broadway, very similar to 111 Broadway. You can just barely see here behind Trinity Church the Gillander Building, um, which is a fascinating building. It's, it, that is a building that had to be built in steel, uh, or maybe had to be built in steel. Um, it is 270 odd feet tall and has a slenderness of 10 and a half. There are very few modern skyscrapers with a slenderness that high. That is, a, that is a very, very slender building. However, it is shorter and less slender than the masonry spire of Trinity Church, which was built in 1848 as a bearing wall structure. So even this late, you know, the, the older building is 1898, I think. Um, what they were doing in steel framing still couldn't quite, you know, hadn't quite surpassed bearing wall structure just a few years earlier. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a view from Brooklyn. And this is much later. The uh, municipal building is late 19-teens. Woolworth building is 1913. There's Singer off on the left. And there's the dome of the Pulitzer building and the spire of the Tribune building. Next slide, please. And a view from the west. There's the Hudson Terminal building, Woolworth Singer. So if I want to just summarize this, um, there's no point in this, in this process where what was built looked nothing like what came before. The biggest technological break is the change from a supporting wall to a supported wall. But architecturally, the buildings are identical. So it, you know, if you want to use the technological distinction of a skeleton frame to, to say this is where skyscrapers start, that's fine with me. It's a distinction that only matters to people, who, you know, to, to the insiders, because somebody looking at these buildings from the street would never be able to tell the difference. And it seems to me with something as uh, emotional as the topic of what's the first skyscraper, you need to be able to point and say that's different than that. Um, and if you can't, 
It's an interesting technological distinction, but not anything more than that. Thank you very much. Say a little bit about the steel, um, quality of the steel, and uh, how that, and the cost of the steel. It would seem to me that uh, this would be a major factor in how high you can go and uh, the cost of these buildings. Did steel actually come down in price? Uh, steel came down in price. The first commercial steel production in the U.S. is 1876. Um, before that, Steel was a special order item. It was very expensive. It was used in machinery more than it was in anything else. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew Carnegie devoted the last quarter of the 19th century to pushing down the price of steel uh, as other people were trying to manipulate it up. You know, so the, if you look at the graph of the steel price, uh, 1870s through 19-teens, it jumps all over the place. What's more important is the relative cost of steel versus raw iron. Um, if steel is 25% stronger than wrought iron and 10% more expensive, it's worth it to use steel. Um, and that difference in, in price between the two metals got smaller as time went along. Uh, I also, I, I think it's easy to overthink this topic. Um, people didn't necessarily do that calculation on any given building. Uh, I think it may have been, you know, some contractors got comfortable using steel early on and some didn't get comfortable until very late. Mm -hmm. uh, that happens today. There are, and, and, and I'm not saying this in the pejorative sense, there are architects and engineers who are more comfortable with concrete construction and steel construction today and vice versa. Um, and therefore, their buildings tend to reflect the material they're more comfortable with. Uh, it isn't necessarily everybody doing a rational calculation about price, although that figures into it. Um, as far as the strength goes, you know, because calculations on wind were, were very primitive at that time, uh, and calculations on seismic didn't exist, seismic building didn't exist, um, people tended to look at the limit on tall buildings as governed by gravity, which we now do not, we don't think that way anymore on tall buildings. Um, Gunnvald Aus, who was a, an engineer who knew his stuff, he was the structural engineer for the Woolworth building, so it's hard to say he didn't know what he was talking about, uh, did a calculation for how tall could you build a tall building um, shortly after the turn of the century, I don't remember exactly when. And he came up with an answer of 2,000 feet, and that was controlled by the foundation pressures. He said you just make the columns bigger. Um, the technology at that time would not have worked in it very well in a 2,000 foot building. Uh, so, I, again, I, I don't think people were thinking along those lines. It was one of the issues that comes up, and I, I didn't really explicitly say it, but I showed it to you, is people were building built tall buildings before they understood the technology that they were using to build them. Um, people were, you know, the, the, the Tribune building was a very tall building. I didn't show you a picture of the Western Union building. That's another very tall building. Uh, that were built using bearing wall construction and you know, no new technology at all to speak of. Um, had there not been economic pressure to build taller, they might have very, very happily continued doing that. Um, but the question you know, comes up, once you can build 12 stories and you, know, you only need four so you rent out the other eight, well wouldn't it be nice if you could build 16 and rent out the other 12, right? You can make more money if you can build taller. Once that logic starts Entering the way people approach real estate, um, they, they want to build taller, and that means the bearing wall structure no longer works. You know, and part of it was uh, code enforced. The, I said before the building codes had those diagrams of how thick your walls had to be. Um, it made it impractical to build very tall bearing wall buildings because if you need six foot thick masonry walls by law uh, to build the height you want, well, that's a taking a lot of space out of your building and be giving you windows that are effectively little tunnels through the, through the wall. Um, the famous example of this is the Monadnock building in Chicago, uh, which is a beautiful building, but I would not want an office on the lower floors because you really have to sort of go crawling into the window to find sunlight. Um, one of the first very peculiar frame buildings in New York, which is the Tower Building, uh, which, took, which, which was built, uh, 18, 1885, 1888, 
um, got around this using the, uh, if the law doesn't explicitly prohibit it, we can do it logic, uh, which was that the law said your walls had to get bigger, but that it didn't discuss how tall your foundations could be. So what if your foundations came six stories above grade, and then you built your bearing wall on top of that? Um, and it was, it's ba it was basically, part of it was a frame building carrying a bearing wall building on top. So I I've simplified the story here a little bit um, because people look for all sorts of ways to get around the restrictions that are on. <clears throat> Wasn't cast iron more dangerous, like if there was a fire as opposed to steel? No. Yeah. Uh, both both are dangerous to fire. I hated to go to Sabo a cast iron building fire because it exploded at some point. If that happened, no. Um, <coughs> cast iron fails in the fire. Typically, it doesn't fail in the fire itself. It fails when the firefighters show up and they throw cold water oh, on okay. hot metal and the form of oh. shock fractures the cast iron. Sorry. And when cast iron fails, it does fail explosively, is the word I would use. Okay. It fails very, very quickly and very completely. Um, but the thing is, a steel frame building on fire will fail just as badly. The reason that Soho had such a bad reputation back when it was the Lower West Side was because those buildings were all wood floor, and a lot of them were fabric warehouses. A lot of them were full of fabric for the ceiling. Um, so when they got burning, there was nothing to stop the fire. Uh, and again, they. they uh, Big old, you know, was warehouse space, big open floors, no internal fire breaks because they had used the clever mixed cage, mixed bearing wall frame of having cast iron columns and beams so there were no internal bearing walls anymore. Um, I'm sorry. So going back to that era, or even before, were wood columns at all in buildings over five stories? Uh, rarely. Um, Wood, wood columns simply were not strong enough. Uh, certainly in the era I'm talking about, the 1880s and 90s, there was a building code that defined the strength of a wood column. So even if you believed it was strong enough, the yeah. code would prevent it. What you will see in, well certainly up to the 1882 building code, and a little bit even after that, is a building that has cast iron columns at the lower floors, and then the very top couple of floors, the columns become wood, which is somebody saving a few, a few dollars. Um, because the columns of the top floors are less heavily loaded. Uh, so you do see that sometimes in seven, eight story buildings, but it's pretty rare. So it's the uh, foundation building of the Cooper Union, the first one to have a real internal steel skeleton? I it doesn't have a steel skeleton. No. <laughs> no. Uh, the foundation building of Cooper Union um, has cast iron columns. It, it, it's what I call the mixed bearing wall building here. It's the exterior bearing wall, cast iron interior columns. What it is is one of the first three buildings built that had wrought iron four beams. Um, Mr. Cooper, whose the first name is escaping me at the moment, uh, owned a uh, Peter. Peter, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> Cooper and Ewan. Peter Cooper and Ewan. Uh, they owned a, uh, a, a rolling mill, and they had been producing railroad rails. And somebody suggested to them, you know, you can take those things and use them as beams. So they rolled a section that they, they went from the rail shape to channels and I beams. Uh, they rolled a whole bunch, uh, I think it was 1851 or 1852, and nobody, you know, nobody knew what to do with them, nobody wanted them. So three, those, that bunch went into three buildings that were constructed in 1853, 1854, uh, all in New York, one of which was the, the Cooper Foundation building. What, what's the difference between cast and wrought iron? Uh, I'm going to give you the very simple version. Uh, wrought iron is similar to steel, it's a, it's a ductile metal. Um, so it bends before it breaks, which is a very good thing from the engineering standpoint. Um, cast iron is stronger in compression, but it is brittle. It fractures when it fails. Uh, it's very weak in tension. So it's, it's good for a column that is only taking gravity load, uh, which, you know, if you think about the, uh, the mixed bearing wall building or the cage building, that's what the columns there are doing. It, it is not good doing anything else. So, so you could not... I have an architect and a contractor in the audience I'm working on with a building on them uh, that is a large apartment house with cast iron columns. Basically the exterior masonry wall, it's a cage building, the exterior masonry wall takes the lateral load because you can't make a frame that can take lateral load out of cast iron columns because that would require the cast iron to be in bending, which it doesn't do well. Does the cast iron have any carbon content? Cast iron has a, has a very high carbon content actually. Uh, steel, cast iron is in the ballpark of 
usually something like two to six percent. Steel is about uh, three quarters of a percent, and wrought iron is close to zero. There's a question here. Tower building was was a mess. It was it worked, uh, and, you know, um, and actually very famously, Bradford Gilbert took an office on the top floor, and you know there was a windstorm shortly after the building was completed. And he said, "You see, I didn't die." Um, but the, the, the building did not make a whole lot of sense. Uh, it had okay. So the, the, you have to think of it as two buildings. There's the Broadway side and the New Street side. The New Street side was a fairly straightforward um, cage frame building. Can you um, mention it was only with 25 well, people? That's the Broadway side. So the New Street side is close to 40 feet wide, so they could do sort of normal cage construction with the wall stepping out. The Broadway side was a 25-foot lot. And if you had wall, and given the height of the building, the walls would have been, I think it was 5 foot 6 at the base. So if you take a 25-foot lot and you take out 11 feet, you really don't have anything work happening. So there was the Broadway side of the building, the Broadway half of the building, where he needed to do, Gilbert needed to do something different. The top... I forget if it's five or six floors of the Broadway side, we're effectively a bearing wall building. The columns continued up, but they weren't connected to anything supporting the walls. So it was, it was pretty much a, a bearing wall building at the top of the building. Mm -hmm. Below that, you had cast iron columns with wrought iron columns immediately adjacent to them, and big diagonal braces running between the wrought iron columns. Some, somebody involved with the project, and I, I may even, I don't remember who it is, I may even at some point have written down who it was, did the engineering to say that you couldn't use the cast iron columns as the point where the bracing connected to because it would fracture the columns. So you've got this double column of a wrought iron column next to a cast iron column and bracing connected to the wrought iron columns. It's not clear from the records that survived where the floor load went, was it to the cast iron or was it to the wrought iron. Um, I think the way, this is based not on proof, this is you know, if I were trying to build that thing. The cast iron columns were taking the floor load. Gilbert used the phrase, a railroad truss set on its end, to describe the wind bracer. So I think what he had was a cage building with a wrought iron truss adjacent to and connected to the columns. It's, which is, as I said, it's, it's a mess. <laughs> um, so I can't give you a better answer because that's as good as the information gets. Since I said you were going to talk about costs, and you really didn't, could okay. you compare the costs of sure. Chicago and New York, or the costs of cage construction? Uh, uh, Chicago and New York would be difficult, but the other is easy. Um, so a, a few years back, I, did, I pretended that I was designing these buildings in 1895, and which would I build? So I said, okay, what's the cost of building them? And it turned out that the big savings was in reducing the masonry work. In other words, the steel and the wrought iron and the cast iron are much more expensive on a per pound basis, but there's much less of them. So if you get rid of the masonry, and keep in mind, masonry is skilled labor on site, which is the most expensive thing in construction. Unskilled labor on site is cheaper. Skilled labor off site is cheaper. Unskilled labor off site is cheapest of all, but rare. So getting rid of the masonry didn't just mean getting rid of a huge volume of material. It meant getting rid of all that skilled labor on site. The walls on a cage building could be thinner than the walls on a, scale, uh, on a bearing wall building. You saved something on the order of half of the cost of the masonry by going from a bearing wall building to a cage building. The cost of the metal that you had to put in place, the cast iron, only took back about 10% of that. So that was the big savings. The savings in going from a cage building to a skeleton building was smaller. It was real. It's about 20% because, again, the walls get thinner. Um, but it, much, a much less of an effect. So from the viewpoint of somebody building a building in 1895, you didn't want to build a bearing wall building because that would be the most expensive thing to do. The difference between building a cage and a skeleton fluctuated with the cost of steel, as was mentioned before. Um, it wasn't as big. It wasn't as much of a determining factor. Uh, the other thing that changes that's completely outside the scope of this talk in that era is people have been building terracotta tile arch floors. Providing, interior, providing usable interior floors. Well, terracotta tile arch floors are heavy and big, and it requires skilled labor on site. 
and around 1900 people start replacing them with concrete draped mesh floors, which um, are cheaper in general. Uh, they could be built using, and I'm getting way off topic here, they could be built using uh, coal cinders as aggregate, and coal cinders were garbage and therefore pretty much free. Um, and the only skilled labor on site was a carpenter to build the form, and you already needed that same carpenter to build uh, the false work for a tile arch floor. So by switching floor types, a lot of money was saved, and the new floors were thinner and, le and weighed less, and therefore meant all the steel work got lighter. So you save money there. So those are the two big places in, from the, from the, from the time the first skeleton frame buildings are built around 1890, what, what makes them less expensive, what makes it realistic to build very big buildings by the, by the first decade of the 20th century? The answer is um, you were getting rid of masonry cost and you were reducing the floor system cost. Yes? How does the uh, Mogardis' uh, early towers, the Tatum and the Mokola, towers fit into your scenario or categorization? Um, this is everybody the quite to hear the question. Uh, James Bogardis, who was the certainly the popular, the great popularizer of cast iron in New York uh, in the mid 19th century, um, built towers of various types. He built shot towers, which were how you made lead shot. You drop molten lead and let it fall, and it would form little spheres in midair. Uh, and he built fire towers, which were exactly what they sound like. People would go up there and look around the city for fire and ring an alarm if one one was seen. Um, so the question was, how did Bogardus' towers affect the argument I'm making? Uh, the answer is not at all. <laughs> um, they weren't seen as buildings. Uh, back to the whole issue of what's a building versus what's not. Um, let me use an example that's much closer in time than Bogardus. The Statue of Liberty has a complete braced wrought iron frame. It was built, it was completed in 1886. So 1886, that's right in the middle of the era I'm talking about. Here somebody has built what is effectively a hundred, uh, it was, the, the statue itself is 150 feet tall. The equivalent of a 15-story building with a wrought iron frame it had no effect on what I'm talking about because people didn't see it as a building. People have a tendency to compartmentalize their profession. And, you know, people building buildings in Manhattan in 1886, oh, the statue is very nice, but we can't do that. We're, you know, our building has masonry walls, not a copper exterior. Our building has interior floors. It's not the same thing. From our perspective, and particularly from the structural perspective I've been talking from tonight, it is a very similar thing, but they didn't see it that way, so it didn't have any effect. People didn't look at Bogardus' shot towers and say, well, that's the way I want to build a building, because one of those shot towers effectively was a chimney, and people were building very tall chimneys. Um, something like the, the spire of Trinity Church is 280 feet tall and very slender, and you can go up it. I've been up it. Um, but people didn't use that as a model for the big office buildings they were building. So I, I think that there's this, uh, this disconnect between available structural models and what was actually going on in the design offices. Well, I'm feeling we could ask you questions all night, and we cer you certainly have demonstrated your expertise in the, the Q&A period. I must, uh, must compliment it was you on, on, on that. But I just want to say that, um, and Sarah would, would tell you that we we'll take our second graders up and around, and we want the first things we ask them is the Statue of Liberty a skyscraper, and we teach them that it is not. So we're completely in line with your theory of what is what at least what is not the first um, skyscraper. So okay. um, so let's thank Don for really.